All righty. It's 11.03, and a whole bunch of people from this side ain't here. But we okay. Are you proud to be in God's house this morning? Thank you all, choir, for being attentive and answering the question. Let's try this again. Are you proud to be in God's house this morning? Yeah. Much better. That's much better. We got a bunch of ladies on the road headed this way in a little bit. We're going to pray for them. But well, here we go. We're going to start off. What is today? Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made. Everyone stand. A little pippy. This is the day. what you're facing, no matter what you're doing, we're going to focus on just this is the day. No matter where you go, this is the day. Here we go. You ready? Now, and smile while we sing. This is the day. Yeah! Good morning again. It's good to see everybody here this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, we're glad to have you this morning as well. We're always glad to see everybody here this morning because this is a day that the Lord has made, and he's made it the day that you and I come and we gather together and we worship and we praise him with all we have and all that we are that, to be thankful for what he's done for us this past week. Now, we could all have our moans and groans about things, but we need to just rejoice in what how great a God we serve and what he has done for us and what he's doing right now and what he plans to do So, as we come together. But it's good to see you this morning. Make sure that you pick up a bulletin and see the things that will be taking place or whatever. It's not very many announcements in, in the bulletin, uh, but just so you can keep up with that as well. Do we have any announcements, anything outside that? I don't think so. Again, just be in prayer for the, the ladies as they traveling back home today for the traveling grace and, and that they may be uh, all excited when they get back home from what they've been at this past weekend. So uh, if, if no other announcements or anything, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we just continue on with the service this morning. <coughs> Father, Lord, we come to you and we just thank you, Lord, that this is a day that you've created, Lord and all the things that you've created, Lord. Father, I just ask you, Lord, as we come together as a body of believers, Lord, that we would just come, Lord, to just sanctify and glorify your name, Lord, and just lift your name up on high, Lord. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would just come and you would just speak to us, Lord, as only you can do, Father. Everyone in this building this morning has a need. Every one of us in here this morning needs you more today than we've ever needed you before. And, Father, we just pray, Lord, today that you would minister to our hearts our souls and our minds, Father. is all the turmoil that's going on, Lord, you're still on the throne. And Father, you're still in control and always will be. And Father, I just pray, Lord, as we come and we, we worship through song, Lord, this morning, and those who play and those who sing, Lord, bless them. Father, I ask you, Lord, to be with Brother Blaine as he comes today and, and, and presents the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. God, I pray that you would just hide him behind the cross and use him, Lord. God, I ask you to speak to him and through him today. Father, and we just pray for the time of invitation, Lord. 
in whatever it is, Lord, today that you have spoken to someone, Lord. God, that they would just respond to it. While we have the time and while we have the opportunity to respond. Father, and I just pray, Lord, that everything that's said and done here today, Lord, that would be glorified to you, Lord. That you would be lifted up the name above all names today. And we praise you for this opportunity that we have. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace and your compassion. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for forgiving, the forgiveness, Lord, of sin, that we might have eternal life for those who have called on your name to be Lord and Savior in their life. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so we've, we, we've established that this is the day. We've got that figured out. So what do we need today? We need to be revived. What a great idea. Let's revive us again. Everyone stand. We need to be revived. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love.
Good morning. Uh, when I decided I was going to sing, I didn't know what to sing, so I picked this song out, but didn't know they were going to, uh, Tyler was going to put it on the schedule for tonight, but anyway, we're going to do it anyway, but one, <laughs> I want to tell you a story I heard this week, and I thought it was mighty good. Uh, there was this woman, she went to her cupboard to get her something to eat, and uh, there was no food in her cupboard. So she got out on her knees and started praying to God. And the next morning she opened up her front door and on her doorsteps was all the groceries she could ever want. She said, he did it. He did it. He did it. And her atheist next door neighbor jumped out of the bushes and said, see there, I heard you praying last night to that so-called God of yours and he didn't do nothing. I went and got all those groceries and put them on your doorsteps. She kept saying, he did it. He did it. The man said, what you don't understand, your God didn't do anything. He said, I went and bought those groceries and put them on your doorsteps. She kept saying, he did it. He did it. And he got the devil to pay for it. Shall be 
slain by a child I'll be changed changed from this creature that I am oh yeah there will be peace in the valley Bibles up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, our young ones here today, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We might need a, well Connie's up there, if we have a, would we have a female volunteer that would go back there in the back, would, you don't mind doing it, okay, thank you so much. That's one of them little deals. Uh, so we have we have all our women at this. Uh, con uh, well, a lot of our ladies are at the conference. So we ain't one of them little situations arise. Praise the Lord! There she goes. Hallelujah! A lot of guys trying to uh, take care of their kids. I was worried about Will, but I seen Will's. Oh, they seem to be doing all right. He got them fed and everything like that. Praise the Lord! First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. So I was talking with somebody uh, just just this week. And uh, one of the conversations that came up, it was one of them, I guess you, a question came up on a particular church um, dealing with the Bible. And it was this asking this question, and um, you don't have to respond to this, so I want you to think about this. And someone comes up and they ask you, you say, when does a soul enter the body? Just want to take a moment, okay? Let's take a moment and think about this. When does the soul enter the body? So I was reading this. It has nothing to do with our church or no one around here, but I got to thinking because I do know this church, and there's a lot of people uh, in the, uh, that go there. Okay? So you can go there, but that don't mean you're learning nothing. Uh, and it doesn't make anybody bad, but it does make it where we're dangerous if we don't know scriptures. So they asked the question, when does the soul enter the body? And as I was watching, you could see... Um, secular responses, okay, what the world would say. Some of them said, well, I just can't see where a soul would be placed into just a glob of cells, okay? So, you know, when uh, at the moment of conception, at the moment of conception is where the soul enters the body. Matter of fact, Scripture says that God knew us before we were formed in our mother's wombs. Amen. The reason as born again believers that we are, that we speak life is because we believe that God is the author, the creator of life. And so it's, it's really easy when you think of something as a glob of cells to, to dispose of it because you don't see it as life. That's why you see as people they in the, the abortion groups where they call it uh, same thing as a leech or a tick because it lives off the host. Now you would think, well, that'd be hard to believe. But what happens sometimes if we're not careful, we assume that everybody in the church knows what the scripture says. It says that God created the man and the woman. It says that God created all from nothingness what makes him God. But if you read the Bible and you don't see the Bible as the word of God, your life is never going to be transformed by it. 
what you'll do is see it just as another book. Like you hear people who claim to be Christians. And uh, so I'm not talking derogatory. I speak as someone seeing the ignorance, the biblical ignorance of where we stand. Do you know that if the Christian, Christian people, me and Ellis was talking about this one day. If Christians alone voted, if, if every Christian voted who claims to be a Christian, and they voted their Christian conviction, there is no other group that can control the elections in the United States. No other group. We would outnumber them all. But the issue is, <laughs> is who's really saved? Who's really saved? It says that many shall say, Lord, Lord, but few shall enter in. And it goes into a lot of theology. But until we start seeing the difference, there's not going to be a transformation take place in our own lives. And that doesn't make people bad if you're sitting somebody next to you and they say, well, this is what I think. So a Christian lives off a standard. And if your standard is you, I want you to think about it a minute. If your standard is what you believe, you don't have much of a basis. You would have a straw man argument dealing with all the conversations because it would be based on just what you think. Ours, as the born-again believer, has to be based upon whether we believe the word as the word of God. So if you can stand with me one moment as we read God's holy word. And I want you to just read this. And we've, we've read this and we've been through this book several times. But I want you to see this. It says, for this reason we also constantly, watch, constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, that's believers, that's like y'all, you accepted it not as the word of man, not from Paul. So some people say, well, you know, that's a Paulian belief if you believe this over here, because, you know, this is Paulian and, and this is it. No. You accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you. Now watch. Which also performs its work in you who believe. So there's a lot of theology in this little simple verse. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. I just thank you, God, that you're here with us, Lord, today. I thank you so much, Lord, for all these ladies that had the opportunity to go to this event. Uh, I just thank you, Father, uh, Lord, for what you did and what you're going to do in their lives. I thank you, Lord, for everyone who's here today. I thank you for the privilege to be able to preach and teach, God. Lord, without you, I'm just nothing. I ask that you would use me today. Forgive me of my failures, my faults, my shortcomings, my sin. And use me, Father. For, Lord, I wish to speak your truth. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. You may be seated. So, when you, so Paul is thanking God for the, the church he, hearing the word of God as the word of God. They didn't hear it as something that came from a man. They didn't hear it as something that came from some kind of preacher. But they heard it as something that was being spoke to their hearts as the word of God. And that's the most transforming thing that takes place is when the children of God starts hearing the word of God as being spoken to them personally from God. And what happens is it starts having an effect in their lives. It starts working in us. One of the reasons that you see the difficulties that take place in the body of Christ and in their homes is we don't believe. There's, cer there's certain things in us that starts doubting. Now, so this, this particular group that I was reading on, it was, a, it was a Bible study of a particular church, and they just asked a question. It was a grand question. It was a great question. There was a lot of good responses, and I'm glad no one crucified anybody else. But it amazed me in how many people had been sitting in the pews and they still could not see that the Bible, the Word of God, is their leading truth. And they kept seeing this blob of sails and they kept seeing just this flesh. They could not perceive that it was something transforming. They received the Word of God as the truth that they could line their lives up with. It would enable them to be able to see abortion for what it truly is. See, it makes a difference if people on Sunday hear the word of God as the word of God and not just from Brother Blaine or Brother Ellis or anybody else who gets up and speak. It has to be that they hear it as something that God is speaking to their hearts. 
And they have to receive it that way. Otherwise, all we're doing is listening to speakers. So when Paul was delivering the message of Jesus Christ and he was delivering the truths of the word of God, this is what astounded him, is that they were allowing them, allowing that word of God to start penetrating lives and transforming them. The reason we're not transformed or there's change in taking place in our lives is we're not hearing that gospel as the gospel for our hearts. You know, a lot of times when you're a young preacher, when you first start preaching, you really believe that people are going to hear the message of Jesus Christ and that they're going to take it and go home with it and start lining their, their lives up with that gospel message. But then as you get older, you realize that some people are just plain deaf. Some people are just plain blind because they're not opening their hearts up to let the Holy Ghost speak to them so that they can be transformed the way Christ has promised that he'll do it. There was an older pastor who had told me years ago, you know, how a, a, bunch of, a bunch of people in his church had come to him. Not in a bad way, but they came to him and he, was, he said when he was a young speaker, he said he's preaching and he's teaching uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, they come to him and said, Pastor, we love the way you're speaking. We love the truth that you're preaching. You know, we can see you're, you're, you're so animated in how you're speaking. And we can see it really convicts your heart. But there's just one thing that's bugging us. It just really bothers. He said, well, what's wrong? They said, well, when you preach it, you act like you really think we're going to do it. Now, I want you to catch this. He looked at them. They said, preacher, we, we love, we want you to continue what you're doing, but don't expect any of us to really be able to do all that that you're talking about. See, I want you, I want you to hear See, because they were hearing it as something that was coming from a guy who's giving them good examples, but they weren't surrendering and saying, you know what, this is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can transform my life. When is the last time something has been starting to change in your life? Are you on that constant same road? The question is, have you surrendered it, said, Lord, speak to me, for I need your, your light on my path. I want you to show me the way. Now, it's so honest when someone says it just tells you the truth. That, listen, I, I'm fine with the preaching. It, it's just I can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is the lack of obedience to the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where the struggle is. That's where man is having all this difficulty. Because until we start obeying the order of Jesus Christ, until we're, um, we start obeying the word of God, we're still going to continue down a path that's going to make us bump our nose and trip up. God says, I want to bless you. The reason we struggle with being blessed is because of the lack of obedience of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. You see, so many sit in churches on Sunday and they're never transformed. There's thousands. My daddy's church, they was running 2,000 and some people in there. Good church. I'm not saying it was bad in any way. But so many of them were doing the same thing as everybody out in the world. Could it be the same thing here? The reason is, is they had a great speaker, a, a great man of God. I really, I really enjoyed him myself. Uh, it was considered the largest country church in the nation for years and years. But the difficulty comes in the fact when we quit hearing that gospel message and all we hear is Brother Stafford, Brother Terry, or Brother Ellis, or whoever else gets up and is speaking right there. That's why so many are, are coming to church, but they walk out the same way they come in because there's not a transformation. Can you imagine me going over there, and, and we'll, I'll utilize Brother Lee since he's here today and he taught Sunday school. Can you imagine me going up to Brother Lee and I say, I go to his dentist's office and say, Brother Lee, you know, man, I have, I got a bad tooth in here. I really need it fixed. He says, well, you know, I understand that. And that's why I went to school all those years to, to learn how to deal with it. And you open up, you know, he comes in. He says, well, come on in here, sit in the chair. And he says, just open your, your mouth up. And you open your mouth up. He says, oh, I think I'm going to have to feel that. No, 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 you, you can't feel that too. Well, but, but you're, you're in pain. You're hurting right here. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I have the education. I have the training. I can help you. I know you told me you've been up for days. You can't sleep. You, you can't have no peace because you're hurting. I know it. I know you have all the education. I know you have all the training. I know you have the truth. But I am not letting anybody change nothing in my mouth. Same way with our lives. 
So many times we hear that gospel and we come and it's not the speaker up here. We're just the not here. There ain't nothing to us. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that when we let it hit our hearts and we start being, you feel it. Haven't you felt the, the Holy Spirit convict you about things in your life? Lead you in certain paths? But you're still struggling with submission? So the whole message is, is, is whether we're going to live out the word of God. There's so many times that we're, we're so inconsistent and we become backslidden in our, in our ways because we're not hearing the message of Christ as coming from Christ to our lives. And there has to be this deep problem. And the deep issues deal with how we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could be uh, until we start reacting to the word as the word that we're going to keep having the same problems. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you, do you find yourself in that pattern where you're still going through the same issues? One of the things that's a problem is whether the, the pastors are going to get up there and preach that message. Preach the gospel and not be afraid of whether some big tither or somebody else is going to get upset. It says in Psalm 119 verse 89, Psalm 119 verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, you, now watch. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Amen. You see, until we start preaching the message as the message of Jesus Christ, people are going to doubt it if the preachers don't even believe it. If a preacher doesn't believe that upon that moment of conception that the spirit enters the body itself. Now, you can call it a clump of cells, whatever it is, no matter what you do, when you kill that clump of cells, that is a human being. This is, it's life. It's life. Or you wouldn't be sitting there right now. All of you started the same way, I hate to tell you. All of you started that way. And every single one of us was blessed because our mothers believed that that truly was life. And I know people go through heart issues. I'm not slinging rocks at that. But until we start seeing it as life, you know what this word is right here? It's life. This is life. You know what Jesus did? He gave you life and he says, I want you to have it more abundantly. But when we doubt, when you doubt any perspective, any portion of the word of God, your life will continue down the same path. When you question everything and people say, I just, I just, I just can't see that clump of cells. I just can't see this as being truly for my life. I can't see what God has said right here is truth. Uh, I know that people are, you know, somebody might be in a, a what they call that, transformant thing where, the, you know, a guy thinks he's a girl and a girl thinks they're a guy. Let me tell you, the, the confusion is not in the gospel. The confusion is in our mind. And it, the confusion is in our heart. All right, so if, if the preacher doesn't believe that the word is infallible, they're going to start sliding and start saying, you know what, it's okay. Now, see, the preacher has no control. He's just a knothead. Unless he speaks the truth of the message of Jesus Christ, no one's life's transformed. You just become comfortable. And what happens when you become comfortable? It's the same thing with a frog. You take a frog, you put him on the stove, you put him in a pot of water, and you just kick up the heat, and he'll just lay there until he's boiled. Let me tell you, it's the same thing. You can come and hear the message, and unless the truth hits your heart and you start hopping out of that thing, you're just going to burn. Amen. Scary thought, isn't it? See, pastors, if, if they're running around with women, if they're doing the drugs, if they're doing the alcohol, if they're not holding to the truth of the gospel message, they're in trouble. You see, the congregation is never going to have a life changing experience until they hear the word of God is infallible. If, if the preachers, it's the preacher's job to preach the word as he believes it, as he has conviction by it. You see, if it don't convict the preacher, it sure ain't going to convict you. It, it won't transform you. So this church that, that has large groups in it and they're on there discussing, discussing at what point the soul enters the body? Well, you know what that tells me? Sunday school teachers. Sunday school teachers, we need to teach it. it we need to teach these things. If we, don't, if we assume that everybody's going to know it just because they're going to get through osmosis because they've been around this, that's going to be the issue. Because 
the, the power is in the gospel message. We, why will anybody ever believe it if the preachers doubt it, if the Sunday school teachers doubt it, if a deacons doubt it, if the parents doubt it? No one's going to believe it. So what is your conviction? Where is your conviction at? Is there any reason, any excuse? And they go into all these medical conditions, and I'm going to tell you right now, y'all have heard me before, if you've been here, you know, they, they recommended to me and my wife to abort two of our children. I have three. God sends me a child about every decade. Hadn't here lately, but he sends me a child about, about every decade, right? And so I have all these issues, and, and with, it's with my two sons, and, uh, you know, they, each one was, was, I was told that they was going to have this problem, uh, you know, and all, they give me all sorts of these horrible descriptions of, of what could be. Now, here's my thing. Now, watch. Now, I know I'm not you and you're you, but here's my thing. My conviction is if God sent me this child, there's a reason. Amen. And no matter what, so this is scary to you now. I understand. If I haven't read anything else, I've read this. Because it's when it becomes personal. So it sounds bold, I'm saying like, so the doctors come and they recommend to me and my wife, they said, you need to go and, and think about an abortion because your children can have this, this, and this. So you know, my, my oldest son, he come out of junior high and he scored a 26 on the ACT, that rascal, and he wouldn't take it again. And uh, coming out of junior high, okay? I'm not trying to brag on him. What I'm trying to tell you is all the issues they said my son was going to have, he ain't got it. I want you to think. He's still alive and well. Walking in hills of Wyoming. He's at church today. He's at a church in Wyoming, him and his wife. My other son, they told me he was going to have all these issues because we were so old and there's a high probability of this and this and this. Here's the thing. If God deemed that for me in my life, then that's God. Amen. And if God said it, I trust him. If, if I can trust him enough to be saved, I can trust him enough to give me the patience and the diligence to raise a child no matter what happens in their lives. It's our hearts. It's whether it's surrendered and say, Lord, have thine own way. You see, the word of God, it, if it's not preached under that, that's where the difficulties come in. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Now watch. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So one of the most important things is that it's under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that someone preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not how loud I shout. He's saying, you know, I'm not that best speaker. You know this all the time. You know, I'm not the best speaker. I'm, I'm not the best this, this, and this. Here's the thing. It has to be under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that the message of Jesus Christ is preached. And because of the power in Jesus Christ is where things, lives can be transformed and touched. One of the greatest needs in our society is anointed preaching of the message of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how intelligent the preacher is or how many good examples that we give or things that make you give him accolades. It's whether you see the light of Jesus Christ in him and in the delivery of the message of Jesus Christ. It's not about the cleverness of it. It's not about how pretty it is. It's about whether it's preached as the word. The word cannot be preached the way it should be without the anointing of a God. And the anointing is coming when the man of God will get upon his needs. And it's the same thing in your life. If you want to see the difference, if we get up under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to lead our family. In other words, we get down and we pray through. Have you heard that before? We start praying through. We get down and won't get up and leave until the Holy Spirit has just poured out upon us. I pray that you've experienced it. If not, you need to try it. You'll like it. I'm going to tell you one of the stories I read about an old preacher. And he, he was going around. I'm preaching, and, I, and I've told this, many of you have heard it before, but I like this message. Uh, there used to be traveling preachers. They all come through here traveling for years, 
you know, this was considered a rural area until all these subdivisions started coming in here. And now we're in this metropolitan area and stuff like this. But there used to be what would be circuit preachers. And there still is one of the workers at my house. Their pastor comes once every two weeks is when they have services. So once every two weeks, we make sure that she's able to go to her church services. She does not miss them. Well, in our churches, we've, we've been blessed where we can have the pastors here all the time. Some of you say yay, some of you say nay, but that's okay too. But with that, it's whether he is he's seeking the Lord. And I was reading about one particular circuit pastor. This is back in the 1800s, and as this old preacher's going through, they would look for a house, and they'd come knock on the door, and, and they'd say, listen, um, I would like to come and preach the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, you, do you think this community would be open to it? And this man, he had knocked on the door and he gave him uh, the story of what his heart was and that he had been called to preaching and he was coming through here. God had led him to this community to preach the message and were they open to it? Now here's one of the issues. That community was having their big celebration that they have every single year. Can you imagine they're having the same celebration every single year on that particular night. I mean, can you imagine how this would mess up the whole world? I mean, they're doing it for years. And he, they said, well, you know, we, we, we like the idea, but you know, tonight is, is our night that we have the community barn dance. And you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And he says, well, listen, I just want to present the gospel. I want to ask you. They said, well, let me ask, Maybe we can give you a few minutes before the dance starts and we'll let you come up and, and you can say a little prayer. Have you ever heard this before? You can say a little prayer and you can give one of them little devotionals, right? I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? Kind of thing. And so <laughs> they invited the man <laughs> to come and stay in the house and they said, well, sure. He says, I'll do it. And he goes upstairs. And I don't know if you've ever been in or any preachers. Used to people would invite you to the houses and stuff and then you'd stay in them and you know, they'd feed him and everything. And, and, but that preacher, he went upstairs and he got on his knees and he started praying. And he started praying. And he was a praying. And the power of the Holy Spirit was coming upon him. And as he was in there praying and seeking the Lord's face, he's crying out to God unashamedly. So the, the daddy at home, you know, at 5 o'clock, they'd always have supper before they was going to this meeting. He says, the pastor ain't come down yet. Won't you go up there and see what's going on? See if he's about ready to come on down and eat supper with everybody. And as this little girl goes upstairs, she had never been around no preachers. They didn't have no pastor in that little community or nothing like that. She's all excited. She's dressed up to go to the dance and stuff. She goes up there, and as she's going up the stairs, she gets to the top. She can hear this man crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ, praying, Lord, Lord, if, if you don't go with me, I can't go down there. I can't preach this. If you're not with me, I'm not going to be able to deliver the message. If you don't come down, I can't go. And that little girl just went and turned around. She went back downstairs. She went back downstairs. And they said, was he coming down yet? Well, he's coming. He's bringing a friend with him, too. I don't know who it is, but well, there ain't nobody went upstairs. Girl, there, he's been up there all day. Hey, there's nobody else up there. I'm telling you, Daddy. He said that if he don't come with him, that he ain't going. It would be something if the body of Christ would pray like that for lost souls. It would be something if we believe the message that the Holy Spirit would fall upon us as we cry out to the Lord God that we need help. It's one thing to say we should pray for our nation and it's another thing to weep over its lost condition and the misunderstanding of our relationship with Jesus Christ because until we start praying with the belief that this is the gospel that has been wrote for for me personally, we're going out there blind yeah. without any direction. There used to be a, 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 a black pastor and his deacons would get around him every Sunday, right? And they'd lay hands upon him and they'd say, Lord, give this man unction. Lord, give him the unction, Father, in the name of Jesus, that the people might hear this message. And when they got through praying and everything, the pastor says, listen, Y'all have been praying for me for a long time to have unction. Exactly what is this unction? Now, don't you think about this a minute. So you can look up the def definition of unction, and you'll see it's, it's something that has meaning to it. But the deacon said, well, I don't rightly know how to explain it, but I know it when I see it. You see, when you see 
the unction in somebody's life, and I have been blessed here lately to see it several times where the power of the Holy Ghost has led them to go and do things that's against their normal nature. See, you can't explain it. But when you know somebody has it, and the Spirit of God is leading them. See, that's the whole reason for dead churches in our whole community, in our, our state, and our nation, is they're not up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them. Everything is in a church is either going to be supernatural or it's going to be superficial. Amen. You get it? Amen. Superficial is just these things where it's a good thing for a church to be busy. You ever see churches? Churches spend more time being busy, and it's not a bad thing in itself. It's not like it's some kind of horrible sin, but that's superficial. How many of you had, you know, we had basketball teams. We had softball teams. We had lots of functions, man. There's lots of functions. And I'm going to tell you something. All that is superficial, and it realize when you get there, <laughs> when you go to like a softball game and you see everybody fighting like a bunch of hoodlums, you understand why that's superficial. Amen. Got quiet. I like all that stuff. I like socialization. But if we ain't got time to weep, over lost souls. If we ain't got time to pray and seek the face of God, there's, more, there's a more difficult situation in our lives. Every time we look out there and we say, look how horrible all these things are in this world. Why is it taking place? Could it be that we're too superficial? You see, the only time it's supernatural is when the presence of God is there. It's the same way in your homes. God cannot remain on your pew like one of those candy wrappers. God cannot remain here and then you go home and expect a powerful movement in your family and your life. The God that you meet goes with you everywhere. It's whether you're willing to accept him. The whole absence of the spirit of God in preaching and in teaching, all of it is a result of a counterfeit conversion. Counterfeit conversions are we come up and say, you know, I don't want to go to hell, Brother Tyler. And if you don't mind, I'll take a little bit of that water and make sure I don't get no fire on me, right? <laughs> what we want is fire insurance. If you just want the fire insurance, you're going to get what you want. But if you want a true relationship with Jesus Christ, it's transforming. Amen. How can you speak to somebody? with the power, with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, if you don't even believe in him. How can you speak and go forth into the boldness of this world uh, like a Noah and go to a place that you ain't crazy about and you fight it all the way, but until you understand, when he preached it, those people believed it. We aren't teaching and preaching the message the way we should. It says in James chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. Now watch. It goes all the way back. It says, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains and all that remains of wickedness. Do you get it? So you might want to unline it. Therefore putting aside all filthiness, no gray areas, you understand? There's no gray in this. And all that remains of wickedness in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save. Now watch, that key word is able to. Able to save your souls, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. So here's your question. Are you a hearer? Are you a doer? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at, a, at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, 
He has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Have you forgotten? You see, never has there been a day where there's been so much preaching. I can go anywhere in this state, anywhere in this country. Even when I was up in Wyoming, and I'm telling you, you can drive a couple hours and not see nobody up there. But you know what you can pick up on the radio? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Anywhere I go around here, I can listen to any particular preacher. Some of them have been dead. Adrian Rogers has been dead how many years? I mean, he's been dead for a long time, man. You know what? The message of Christ is still going out. So we have all this preaching that's take place. But the question is, what good is preaching if there's no obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? What good is it if we're not obedient to the message that God has for us? What good does it do to, to hear like somebody like Adrian Rogers, who is a great pastor, who is a great preacher, but you never respond in obedience to that message? What good does it do to go to every Bible conference that's ever been known to mankind, but you don't do what you hear in the message? See, most of us know more than we're obeying. You, you, I wonder, I ain't heard nothing. I'm like, I'm all by myself. Ellis, you got to say something up in here. <laughs> most of us know more than what we're obeying. Yes. Why is that? You see, what, what happens when you hear the message, when you hear the word of God, when you read that message of Jesus Christ, and you don't obey it, it sears your conscience. When you know to do right, yet you keep doing wrong, you weep a little bit, you feel a little bit better, then you go back and you continue doing that same thing. You start getting calloused about it. Seared where nothing else can penetrate. See, nowhere does God promise anything to somebody who just hears that message. He doesn't promise you anything just because you sit in a pew or you turn your radio on or you've got all sorts of little things around the house that remind you. It's the doers of the word, the obedience to the message of Jesus Christ. There's hundreds of promises to the people that are obedient to the gospel message that their lives will be transformed. But do you believe it's true? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, it says, not everyone who says to me, now watch, Lord, Lord. Now, now get this. This is, this is one of them things that burns in my heart because I'm concerned. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does. Now watch. This is what you underline. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. It don't say nothing about losing it. It don't say nothing about losing it. It says you ain't got it. Amen. It says many will say to me on that last day. Many are going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Now listen to this description. And in your name, cast out demons. Now think about it. You've seen somebody cast out demons. You're like, whoo, I want to go to that church, hallelujah. There's no power in that guy. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. The demons must flee. And in your name, perform many miracles. Lots of people go around, don't know nothing. But there's power in the name of Jesus. And then I will declare to them, Here, here's man, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy on me. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Have you ever had that? So, you know, one of the most horrible things that you'll ever see, I believe, in today's society, in my opinion, one of the most horrible things I see is this Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. You walk in one day. And 
somebody doesn't recognize you. And you've been with them all your life. Can you imagine standing before the creator of the universe? You've been at church all your life. You've said his name all your life. But he don't know you. If we hear the word of God, if we hear the word of God as the word of God, it, it works in us. So let me ask you, what has the Holy Spirit been doing in your life here lately? Let's just ask this. Because, you know, you've got to do an examination. What has God been transforming my life or telling me that I need to, to stop or get to do? It says that we're conformed to the image of Christ. So let me ask you. Do you look like Christ? You know, we sing that song, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So what does hearing, believing, and obeying of the word of God, what does it produce in my life, really? What, what's it come to? So in the, in the book of Jonah, you know, in chapter 3, what I brought up a while ago. So Jonah, you, we, we go up and, uh, yeah, I said no a while ago, didn't I? I apologize. I apologize. That was a misspoke. See, Jonah, he's going into Nineveh. He's going to preach the judgment of destruction to this nation. A bunch of heathens right there, right? And the Bible says that the people of Nineveh believed God. So this is what, and, and y'all have heard me speak on this before. Do you hear it as be, believing? See, they heard the word of God as the word of God. And what they did is they responded properly to what the Spirit was speaking to them. And what they did is they called for a fast. And, and y'all know, they, it says that they humbled themselves. And that's one of the hardest things is to humble ourselves. And they, they put on sackcloth. And most people would laugh at that. But some of you understand where this is going. Some of you have experienced this. And they cried out to God. Matter of fact, it said that the king got down off his throne because the only one that should have been enthroned there is God Almighty. See, when you, when you hear the word of God as the word of God, it causes us to vacate the throne of our life. I want you to think about your life. I mean, how many times do we do everything to please us? It's human nature, is it not? See, it's a difference in, in our nature. So properly hearing that word of God, it causes us to get off the throne, and that is where Jesus becomes enthroned into our heart. self Owning of the throne always hinders God's work. It always keeps it from where it should be. It keeps us from the true revival that everybody talks about. It's ourselves. So the king, it says that the king took his robe, right? He, he, he laid his robe and took it off because he knew it wasn't for him. We got to take our robes off of self-sufficiency, of, of self-glory, of, of, of self-righteousness, of, of hypocrisy, and examine ourselves. We need to get honest with God and, and just look at it and say, Lord, I have been struggling believing this. See, you either believe it 100% or you don't. Amen. It's either 100 There is no in-between. It says if you add to or subtract from, right? That's right? Go back there in Revelation. Add to and subtract from this, buddy, you've got troubles. That's the problem. See, no, this city, this, this total heathen city of Nineveh, they heard it as the word of God, and they received it, and they obeyed it. And thus, the destruction was set aside. See, a, a Gentile nation that had no promises was saved. Same thing with our lives. It's one thing to say I'm saved. It's another thing to be saved. It's another thing to say that I believe the word of God. And it's another thing to obey the word of God. It's all open to us. What have you decided? If you could bow your heads for just a moment.